Yeah, I, th I think the Internet of Things is the second major revolution in the Internet. And I think in 10, certainly 20 years, we're going to look back and say that was the real revolution in the Internet, that the first one was simply a prelude. So what am I talking about? The original Internet, where we connect our phones, screen, we connect our tablets, it's a screen. We connect our laptops, it's a screen. We connect our personal computers, it's a screen. We connect our TVs, it's a screen. We've connected a lot of screens to the internet and extracted enormous value from moving uh, data, information, exchange across those screens. It's delivered a digital economy that's gone from zero to tens of trillions of dollars in a, only a couple of decades. And many people, including myself, have made a career out of that business. It's been a fantastic business and a transformational impact on the face of the planet. But at its core, it's been connecting of screens. So if we consider what it might be like if not just the screens were connected, but everything was connected, wouldn't that be an interesting potentially very interesting transformation for us as individuals, for our education environments, for our social engagements, for our work environments, for the planet, if we could deliver on that transformation. And that's the second revolution. It's the first revolution, Internet of Screens. The second revolution is the Internet of Things. So how do I engage in the revolution that is the Internet of Things? Well, it's five easy steps. The first and most obvious thing is select a thing. A light bulb, a washing machine, a car, a lawn, a building. Just select a thing that matters to you. Step two, you now need to add a brain to that thing. Because we're going to ask that thing to be self-aware. We're going to ask it to be smart. So we need to add a brain, a microprocessor or a computer that allows that thing to think for itself. Step three, we need the thing to communicate with the internet. So we've got to add a voice, we've got to add some ears to that. We, we need connectivity. Now that connectivity could be wired, like a USB connector on your laptop, or it could be wireless, like a phone connection. Step four, we connect the cloud. We have a smart thing that's connected to the internet and it's capable of using the intelligence of the internet and all other things connected to the internet as well as the intelligence we've built into it. And so you get to step five, which is making cool new things happen. So what happens in this step will be driven by the problems you have or by the opportunities you see. So this step should only be limited by imagination. Once you select things, embed a brain, hook it to the internet. Once that infrastructure, once that framework, once that skeleton is in place, the rest is about unleashing imagination. One of my favorite and most easily understood examples of the Internet of Things is Kimberly Nixon. Some years back, uh, she started with a real world problem, which was her cat, Gus, uh, needed to get access to her kitchen through her cat door in order to have the 
food that was required to get Gus through the day. Unfortunately, the entire neighborhood's cats became aware of the goodies that lay beyond Kimberly's door. And so Kim would arrive home to not just a hungry Gus, but to a pretty messed up kitchen. So she had a real world problem statement. Her answer to that was to add a brain to the door to make the door intelligent. And that intelligent door knew that Gus had arrived and allowed Gus in, but didn't allow other cats in. Then she hooked her door to the internet so that the arrival of Gus was announced on the tweetosphere as, hi, I'm home, and his departure likewise was announced. And then added a, a simple, cheap camera in the house that snapped a photograph of Gus as he arrived into the house and posted it to what else but his Facebook page. So she took a thing, she added a brain, she added connectivity, and she unleashed a solution, a pretty elegant, I think, solution to her real-world problem statement. One of the things we will need to get our heads around to understand how to bring all of the opportunity that Internet of Things offers is the specifics around taking a thing and making it smart and intelligent right up to this high level of abstraction called systems of systems, where smart cities will operate by having smart transport systems talk to, smart vehicles talk to, smart uh, building systems to smart emergency service systems. So these are abstract concepts and detailed thing concepts and it's how do you get your head around all of that? Huh? The key concept to this is abstraction. So let me illustrate it with a transmission system, especially in the community of geeky hardware and software guys that I hang out in, if you show a picture of a transmission system and say discuss, they'll say, well, yeah, transmission systems are comprised of things like cylinders and valves. Okay, great. Talk more about cylinders and valves. Well, they're comprised of, of steel and rubber and various materials. Okay, talk to me about steel and rubber. Well, they're composed of molecules and, and atoms, and they are in turn composed of protons and electrons, and they're in turn composed of quarks and, and of super strings. So we work our way down the complexity scale into detail. We also have to work our way up. So the transmission or braking systems are part of an engine. The engine is part of a car. The car is part of a transport system. The transport system is in turn part of physical mobility in general, which is a subset of mobility. And if we abstract it right up, we end up at one of my old favorite TV series of Star Trek, and it's the Beam Me Up Scotty. It's important that we are able to handle the real world, which is scope with complexity. How do you handle huge scope with high degrees of complexity? And the answer is with the right layer of abstraction. Uh -huh. You need to be able to chunk down so that you can control complexity. We need to be able to chunk up so that we can control scope. Ah. So the problem of complex system implementation like Internet of Things on planet Earth is scope with a high degree of complexity and a, an important concept in handling that is abstraction. There's a 7,000-year-old business that's important to a large portion of the planet, and that's the beer industry. And clearly it's evolved fairly significantly since its early days. But for 
any of us who've ever worked in the beer business, um, and I've had my time as a teenager behind bars, and I look at it through the lens of a friend of mine, Pat Coleman. Hmm. There's a particular problem that presents itself in the bar, and that is when to change kegs. If I change them too early, I'm throwing away beer. That's not a smart thing. If I change them too late, I get an irritated customer by pouring a pint of foam and then shuffling downstairs to get it sorted. So it's a real world problem in a 7,000 year old business. Well, an interesting company called SteadyServe has stepped up to address my old teenage problems and Pat Coleman's problems today. And that is by finding a way to add some intelligence to the keg. And the way they've added intelligence to the keg is they take a weighing scales. They place them under the keg. The weighing scales are calibrated to full, they're calibrated to empty. And so suddenly they've added some intelligence to the keg. It now knows how full or empty it is with a microprocessor built into it, the weighing scales. Um, SteadyServe have then connected that weighing scales to the internet. Um, they happen to use Wi-Fi. And now with the connection to the internet, the information about how full or empty the keg is, is now freely available to Pat Coleman in the bar that says, here's the degree of fullness or emptiness of my range of many kegs of beer so that he can choose the right point or in fact allow the smartness of the internet to be used to select the optimum ah. point to get somebody to go change out the beers to find that right crossover between minimum waste of thrown away beer without the downside of an irritated customer in a very important venue to me called a bar. My favorite mathematical concept is the exponential. It's incredibly important concept. It's incredibly unintuitive. So it's worth taking a minute to think it through. We live in a linear world. If I take 20 steps in a linear world, one, two, three, four to 20, I've moved about 20 meters. In other words, about halfway across a football pitch. If I take 20 steps in exponential space, where each step is a doubling of the prior, now it's 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. Each step I take doubles all of the steps that have been taken before. And guess what? 20 steps in exponential space gets us to? It gets us to the moon and back. I think it's fair to say that's not intuitive, but why is it relevant? Why even bring it up? The reality of technology, compute performance, connectivity, storage, is that those technologies don't live in a linear world. They live in an exponential world. Compute performance doubles every two years. It's famously called Moore's Law, one of the founders of Intel Corporation. And because compute and storage and connectivity behave like that, then the cost point, price point, and size of compute connect that's available to us drops exponentially. And instead of only seeing connected smart things in enormous multi-billion dollar factories, like the semiconductor factories I work in, now that capability is available in pill bottles, cars, in rooms. It's available to all of us. So exponentials can no longer be a little niche high-tech community of folks that understand it and apply it. It needs to be broadly understood and those who get it uh -huh. will transform their businesses and those who don't will be left behind. <laughs>